Elijah was a member of the Brotherhood of Steel, serving as a scribe, tasked with researching, cataloguing information, and processing any technologies the knights and scribes retrieved. This was his life, but it quickly became clear that Elijah was destined to be so much more than a simple scribe. His understanding of technology was unrivaled. With a mere glance, he could understand complex and intricate machines, and he could do it quickly. Understanding the inner workings of something was as natural to him as breathing. This genius was both feared and revered by the other scribes, and Elijah's high level of comprehension was soon noticed by many of the Order's elders. Now, because of Elijah's talent, the elders decided to break their usual caucus and appointed Elijah as a new elder. This was unusual, if not unheard of, because Elijah was a scribe, and traditionally the rank of elder was only ever given to paladins, but due to his extraordinary craft, an exception was made. But what the elders thought was a brilliant idea, promoting such a bright mind into their senior ranks would eventually turn into a burden, as Elijah was no longer afraid of what the others would say about his heretical ways of thinking. Instead of simply retrieving and preserving technology, Elijah wanted to replicate and enhance it, which the elders and many of the others really did not like. But Elijah continued to dispatch journeymen on tech retrieval missions and pushed for new technologies to be made, which were often morally debatable, and slowly over time his relationship within the Brotherhood was stretched to breaking point. Very rarely did he speak to other members face to face, instead preferring to do so through computers, and the only real connection he had within the Order was through Veronica Sant'Angelo. Veronica was born into the Brotherhood, and as a child, had lost both of her parents to the NCR. This led to her being raised collectively by the Brotherhood, and soon Elijah had taken a liking to her, as she too showed an unnatural understanding towards technology. Naturally, he became her mentor, and through him she became an engineering prodigy, who much like himself, grew to question the Brotherhood's directive, and in many ways, she was another Elijah, and he would do whatever he needed to, in order to ensure that she remained by his side, even if it meant breaking her heart. You see, Veronica had this childhood friend, Christine Royce, who over the years had become more of a love interest, which didn't sit well within the Order, as their numbers were few and all members were obligated to procreate, and that didn't sit well with Christine, so she left. Or at least that is what Veronica was told by Christine's parents. In reality, Elijah had used his position to remove Christine from the picture, not because he was against their love, but because he was afraid Veronica would leave his side, and so Christine had to go. Elijah had what he wanted, a vulnerable Veronica who idolized him, and together they continued to test the Brotherhood's patience with heresy, so much so the other elders considered removing Elijah from the Brotherhood altogether. But despite his unorthodox ways, he was still useful. So when he approached the Elders with the request to seek out technology and begin a new chapter in the Mojave, they agreed under the condition that he take and hold Hoover Dam, as it was essential to securing power within the region. Elijah agreed and left with Veronica by his side and many others who followed him, whether willingly or not. On his way east to Hoover Dam, Elijah saw a dark tower surrounded by glimmering mirrors, and immediately he knew he had stumbled onto something great, something powerful. He just had to unlock it. And then he did something that no one had expected. He ignored his orders to investigate Hoover Dam, and instead decided to secure a base at the tower that was Helios 1. This led to whispers among the group of how Elijah had strayed from his mission, and how he was no longer acting with the Brotherhood's best interest in mind. Instead of taking Hoover Dam, Elijah focused on cracking Helios 1, which allowed groups such as the Van Graffs to expand and sell laser and plasma weapons, something the Brotherhood would have and should have prevented. 
But Elijah was too busy pursuing his own interests, and amongst it all, he received word that the NCR had entered the region and now occupied Hoover Dam. This caused tension between the two factions as they disagreed over how the technology should be controlled, a strife that would rage for two years during what would be known as the Brotherhood War. Nearing the end of this war, it slowly became clear to Elijah that he was on the losing side, but he refused to accept defeat and became obsessed with finding technology that could turn the tides of war in his favour. He began sending journeymen, including Veronica, to find technology. These excursions were tactically questionable as it left the tower weaker than it already was, and more often than not, they returned empty-handed or with technology that just wasn't what he needed. As tension between the Brotherhood and NCR grew, Elijah found what he was searching for, and it was right in front of him the entire time. Before the Great War, Poseidon Energy cooperated with the US Army to create a powerful weapon known as Archimedes I and II. This weapon system has two functions. The first is a defensive land-based directed energy weapon that protects the facility, and the second is an offensive energy-based artillery satellite that attacks off-site through collection arrays and a range finder. Now Elijah fully believed that he could unlock this power and use it to destroy the NCR and take control of Hoover Dam. And while Elijah had tracked the rangefinder to the strip, meaning he was close to unlocking the tower's true potential, he simply didn't have enough time to get the job done. The Brotherhood War ultimately ended with the NCR invading Helios 1. They had already destroyed several of the Brotherhood's bunkers, weakening their strength, and now they were directing their focus on their main base, aiming to finally push the Brotherhood of Steel out of the region for good. Despite their poor position and dwindling numbers, Elijah refused to retreat and desperately tried to get Archimedes I online, but he couldn't. Elijah was unable to bend the machine to his will, and realizing the inevitable collapse, Elijah slipped away, leaving his chapter to fend for themselves. In the heat of battle, Nolan McNamara pulled as many of the knights and scribes as he could together and retreated for Hidden Valley, a fallback point that had been discussed but never really considered. They had lost this war, and their leader was now gone, suspected to be dead. With Helios I now under NCR control, Elijah headed for a small shack near Gibson's scrapyard. Veronica had also survived this war, as she was away elsewhere scavenging for technology at the behest of Elijah, and this shack was how she would communicate with him during missions, through a computer as he always preferred, and knowing that she would one day return to this shack, he left a note for her to find. Elijah explained that the Brotherhood was doomed, and he was leaving but would return with one of the greatest treasures of the old world and wipe the slate clean. To Veronica, this was unlike the Elijah that she knew. He had always been unstable, but now he seemed delusional, with the only familiar thing about the entire note being the signature. And so Elijah travelled, and while the records are incomplete, evidence does suggest that he travelled outside of NCR jurisdiction and came across the ciphers of the West a tribe of scientifically gifted people, but everything that happened during his time with them is unknown. But what we do know is he travelled to the Divide, perhaps intrigued by the stories of how the Earth had been torn in half, creating an endless storm that flayed the NCR soldiers alive, something Elijah would have wanted for himself, and after learning that these unnatural, everlasting storms were powered by a malfunctioning weather machine that scientists at Big Mountain had created, he decided to go there next, curious as to what other weapons they had made, intentionally or not. Arriving at Big Mountain, Elijah was swiftly captured by the think tank, although this was temporarily, as he quickly escaped in the blink of an eye, much to their surprise. 
While exploring the scientific expanse, he came across many dangers. Lobotomites, robo-scorpions, and berserk securitrons. But he also came across Ulysses, a courier with a mission of his own. Together they sat, and through conversation, Elijah learned of the Sierra Madre, and the toxic gas, the weaponized holograms, and dispensers within. Everything he needed to begin again. But first he needed to find the casino, and as much as he wanted to do it alone, he feared he would be unable to. And so he sought a way to ensure cooperation, whether they liked it or not, and little Yang Zi was the key to unlocking this loyalty. Little Yang Zi, the pre-war concentration camp dubbed the Human Farm, where Chinese citizens suspected of treason were taken before the Great War. Radiation has since transformed the survivors into ghouls, but they haven't left. They are unable to, due to the bomb collars around their necks, and at the sight of these, Elijah knew what needed to be done. Avoiding the local robots, Elijah began capturing and experimenting with the explosive collars, and all the while searching for the mythical broadcast that Ulysses had mentioned. Over the course of three days, Elijah would deconstruct an unknown amount of collars, most of the ghouls would die, some thanks to his interfering, while others die trying to escape from this strange old man that had come from beyond Big Mountain. Either way, in his eyes their deaths were necessary, and it was done. Elijah had fine-tuned the collars, and now they no longer exploded when passing the boundary, meaning they could now be reused and set to detonate at a frequency of his choice or remotely detonated using a handheld detonator. Suffering from terrible migraines due to mentat abuse, Elijah was ready to take a break and focus on something a little less intense, finding the casino's radio frequency. But before he could get started, he saw a glint coming from the building on the other side of the compound. He wondered if it was the courier from before, but his instincts told him it was someone else. After deserting his chapter at Helios 1, which was a crime that wouldn't go unnoticed, and if possible, unpunished, the Brotherhood had discovered that Elijah was alive and dispatched an assassin to track him down and execute him, although this was something that Elijah had been anticipating. This assassin was none other than Christine Royce, the very same that Elijah had sent away to ensure that Veronica would join him. She was now a member of the Circle of Steel, a subgroup of the Brotherhood of Steel specifically tasked with internal affairs. And this glare that Elijah saw was the scope of Christine's sniper rifle. She took her shot, but Elijah was already aware of her position and intention, and easily avoided getting hit. Christine had not only missed her target, but had also attracted the attention of the think tank robots. Soon the concentration camp was under fire from all sides. An assassin, robots, ghouls with explosive collars, and Father Elijah with weapons that, according to Dr. O, cut through robots like cheese paper, of course referring to his jury-rigged Tesla cannon. Waiting for the correct time to act, Elijah used several of the collars he now controlled as walking mines, turning the camp into a field of fire and shrapnel that caught Christine off guard and rendered her unconscious. At the sight of her limp body being hauled away by medical robots, likely to join the lobotomite ranks, Elijah made his escape, slipping away once more, unscathed and undeterred. Now out of harm's way, Elijah moved to the transmitter of Signal Hill, but it was far too exposed for his liking, and the transmitter he would need to locate the casino signal was vulnerable with him being there. He needed a different location. Little Yang Zi was out of the question. The canyons were too dangerous, and while the weather station seemed like a good place to go, Ulysses had already gone there, and going there too sounded like trouble. With very few options left, Elijah hacked the transmitter and set up a remote link so he could listen to the incoming signals whenever he wanted using his Pip-Boy. 
and began searching for somewhere that still had a clear line of sight to the transmitter in order to receive the best signal, but also somewhere he felt safe enough to get some rest. And so Elijah began searching, scouring the waste disposal site and the Securitron plant, and it was here he made his new camp on a rocky plateau, close to the transmitter, and just as, if not closer, to what he knew would be his way out of Big Mountain. While it was safe enough to stay, Berserk Securitrons from the nearby plant roamed the area. Luckily, these robots were shoddily constructed and couldn't be controlled by the think tank, who incessantly sent robots to capture him, to no avail, and now we have these Securitrons acting as an additional line of defense. But as a precaution to protect himself while he worked, and more importantly slept, he set up a turret perimeter and focused on finally finding the signal he so desperately sought. Elijah waited. His turrets protected him, and he listened to all radio signals picked up by the transmitter at Signal Hill. Most of it was junk, a babbling doctor named Mobius, a mysterious broadcast playing an assortment of blues and jazz, and finally, a woman's voice, both pleasant and enticing. Has your life taken a turn? Do troubles beset you? Has fortune left you behind? If so, the Sierra Madre Casino, in all its glory, is inviting you to begin again. It was done. Elijah could now triangulate the signal and find his way to the Sierra Madre, and best of all, he could do it alone. With no reason to remain at Big Mountain, Elijah made sure the doctors that had captured him and continued trying to capture him since he escaped wouldn't forget him anytime soon. Hacking into the think tank's mainframe, Elijah was met with little resistance. Dr. 8 tried to stop him, but Elijah fried his voice module before rerouting Dr. O's processor, using it to take control of the train network, which he then used to punch out the northern tunnel and escape, leaving behind him a trail of chaos and a tale not soon forgotten. Returning to the Mojave, Elijah sought shelter in an abandoned Brotherhood of Steel bunker and restored it to working order, fully intending to use it as a base of operations for when he unlocked the technologies he needed. He soon began making round trips to the Sierra Madre and his bunker, collecting samples of the casino's environment in order to understand what he was getting himself into, and once he was ready, he left a final message for Veronica just in case he didn't make it back. At the Sierra Madre, Elijah found everything he had hoped for. The cloud that enveloped the area had preserved the casino, and all of its treasure remained pristine and intact, ripe for the taking, and once understood it could be used to preserve other old world relics. Elijah marveled at the automated security systems, the invulnerable holograms, perfected versions of the ones he had been told about at Big Mountain by Ulysses. A single hologram could become a one-man army. By simply placing one of their emitters amidst a battle, you could watch as your enemies tried helplessly to destroy it. But these holograms were nothing in comparison to the Sierra Madre vending machines. Machines capable of transmogrifying matter, a Sierra Madre chip, into something else. Food, medicine, clothing, weapons, everything a new nation would need to thrive. And that was Elijah's plan, to cleanse the Mojave with the cloud, killing all who opposed him while preserving technology. The holograms would provide defense, the collars ensure compliance, and the vending machines would provide everything else. It was all here, right at his fingertips, and there it would stay for quite some time. Quickly, Elijah realized that despite wanting to do this alone, he couldn't. The casino's vault was too grand, too much for a single person to unlock. He understood its workings, but to get the job done, he would need more hands. And he found them, in the form of treasure hunters, explorers, and fortune seekers who came here either hoping to begin again, as the voice claimed possible, or in search of treasure. 
It didn't matter how they got here or why they came, all that mattered was they were and they could be used. Elijah trapped the first person he came across and enslaved them using a bomb collar from Big Mountain, and then he forced them to do the same to the next person, and so on until there was enough people to split into teams and crack the casino. But at the first sign of progress, the captives would turn on one another, believing they could claim the secrets for themselves. This of course didn't work, and Elijah grew tired of having to start over. That was until one day he came across a Nightkin, which he named Dog for his loyalty. Now as you may know, Nightkin once served the Master, and with him being destroyed by the Vault Dweller, they moved on. Some became their own Master, while others sought out new ones, including Dog, who found what he was searching for in Elijah. Elijah saw the potential in Dog, and set up the radio signal to be broadcast from his bunker in the Mojave, among other man traps. Those that followed the signal would be gassed, collared, and carried by Dog to the Madre. And with these teams, Elijah continued to try and unlock the casino, and then one day, he did. The opening ceremony had been activated, and Elijah went inside. But for whatever reason, the casino shut down, the doors locked, and Elijah was now trapped inside. To his dismay, he was only part way to getting what he wanted, and to add insult to injury, the casino's walls and floors had been made with alloys that interfered with the collars and prevented him from contacting his team outside. His loyal dog was unreachable. The rest of the team, still outside, now had no one telling them what to do, and Elijah no longer had the power to detonate their collars if they refused to cooperate. Some would have died to the cloud, or to the creatures within. Perhaps one or two decided to leave, while others were eaten by Dog, and in time, only one of them was left. Elijah had no other choice than to accept his fate. He was trapped inside, and without options, it seemed like the end. An unknown amount of time passed, and all hope was lost. That was until his Pip-Boy detected another. Dog had continued his work, travelling to and from the Sierra Madre, collaring and capturing those who entered the bunker back in the Mojave, and through luck, or perhaps fate, one of those people, Courier 6, just so happened to be wearing a Pip-Boy. What Dog had just done was give Elijah a second chance. A way to communicate with the outside world, and through this new connection, was able to retake control of the situation. This time Elijah was taking no chances. He had no idea why the casino had sealed him inside, it could have been an error with the automated security system, or perhaps someone outside was interfering. Either way, Elijah removed the final, if only bit of control the captives had. Reconfiguring the collars, he made sure that they were all connected, and if one of them died, they all died. To Elijah's surprise, there were still four people in the villa that he had control over. Dog, his loyal nightkin, Dean Domino, a pre-war lounge singer turned ghoul, Christine Royce, his would-be assassin, and Courier Six. Through these ragtag of misfits, Elijah intends to not escape the casino, but to unlock the vault and wipe the slate clean. But what happens after that is up to you. Despite having the chance to leave, Elijah never will. He is simply too close to completing his plan. He is unwilling to let go, and will either die for his dream, become trapped for the foreseeable future, or succeed and create his new world, which we are able to learn about if the courier was to side with him. In the years that followed, the legend of the Sierra Madre faded, and there were no new visitors to the city. Years later, when a mysterious blood-red cloud began to roll across the Mojave, then west toward the Republic, no one knew where it had come from. Only that it brought death in its wake. Attempts to find the source of the toxic cloud failed. The Mojave was cut off. Through the cloud, lights were seen from Helios 1. 
There were stories of ghosts immune to gunfire who struck down anyone they saw with rays of light. The last chapter of the Mojave came when a modified Repcon rocket struck Hoover Dam, releasing a blood-red cloud, killing all stationed there. All attempts to penetrate the cloud and retake the dam failed, and both the NCR and Legion finally turned away from it, citing the place as cursed. Only two remained alive in the depths of the cloud at the Sierra Madre, waiting for their new world to begin again. Be sure to show your support by liking the video and subscribing if you haven't already for more Fallout content. If there's anything you would like to see in a later video, leave a comment and I'll see what I can do. With that said, thank you as always for watching and I'll see you in the next adventure.